Will you turn again in the Word of God to the book of Genesis? And we're out of chapter 12 tonight. We're still talking about the man who built altars. But this is a new message, a new chapter, and we're moving on. And that really is the title of the message tonight, Moving in the Right Direction. Moving in the Right Direction. Chapter 13, I want to begin to read at verse 12, and we'll read down to verse 18. So it's Genesis chapter 13, beginning to read at verse 12. Let us now hear God's word. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt or dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. A bad move. He's not moving in the right direction. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. That's the reason why he wasn't going in the right direction. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent, and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. May God bless his word to all of our hearts tonight for Christ's sake. Moving in the right direction. After Abraham arrived in the land of Canaan, and I think I should say that it was a very long journey. He had traveled around 900 miles or 1,000 miles. It's hard to know, but that gives you an idea of the distance or the length of the journey that God's servant had to take, 900 or 1,000 miles. And the first place he went to when he arrived in the land of Canaan was Sychem, and there he built his first altar, chapter 12, verse 7. And we could say then that this was the place of strength because if you can recall, uh, Shechem means shoulder or it also can mean strength. So he came to the place of strength. The second altar he built was between Bethel and Hai, chapter 12 and verse 8. And we could say this was the place of supplication because when he arrived there, he began to call on the name of the Lord. Of course he did that at all of his elders, by the way, but we're using this here. This was the place of supplication. Later he left there and went down into Egypt, but sadly there was no altar there. Then he traveled up from Egypt into the south of the land of Canaan, and from there he went back to between Bethel and Hai, where he had built his altar at the start, uh, before, chapter 13 and verse 4. Now, let's just pause for a moment and think about the situation. He had raised an altar. He had built an altar. Then he removed from the altar. And then he returned to the altar. This is not a new altar in verse 4. This was the one that they had used before. It had not been in use for a considerable period of time. So he had to repair the altar before he set about worshiping God again. Now some commentators believe that he spent a few years in Egypt. Now I could not say that for sure. I'm not sure just how long he spent down in the land of Egypt, but if we go by the commentators, he could have been there for a few years. And during that time, of course, he prospered. He had his problems, he had his difficulties, but he did prosper in material things. 
Later then he moved to Hebron and built another altar and I have decided to call this the place of separation because he had separated himself uh, from Lot and he moved to Hebron and there he erected this third altar to the glory of God. He was a pilgrim, a man on the move, living in a tent, but he was also a worshipper because he kept building these altars. And that's something that he left behind him. Some people leave uh, a good testimony. Some people leave a bad testimony behind when they move on. When he moved on, he always left behind an altar. And anyone arriving at that particular scene, I'm sure they asked the question, who was here? What was this used for? And then the news may have filtered uh, through to them. A man of God used to worship God here. So as he moved on, he left altars behind him. He was a worshiper of God. So these are three significant places where he built altars. Now having considered the first two of these, uh, tonight we come to think about the third in the, series, in the series. And this one was located in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, according to verse 18. Now, three simple things that I want to share with you tonight about this particular altar. First of all, this altar was a place of faithfulness. Now, what do I mean by that? Abraham's life was now being directed and governed by the word of God. You can see in the Bible reading in verse 14, and the Lord said unto Abraham. So the Lord is speaking to him once again. Now you think about that. In chapter 12, we read about Abraham's failure. He slipped. But now in this chapter, God speaks to him again. And that proves and shows to us God's faithfulness. Even when we fail, God still remains faithful. How do I know? Because God spoke to his servant. So if Abraham has failed, he slipped. God is faithful and God spoke. So God rescued Abraham out of Egypt. He restored Abraham. And then he revealed himself unto Abraham through his spoken word. Oh, that we might hear his voice tonight again in the place of prayer. The walls of a room in an old Scottish mansion were filled with sketches made by distinguished artists. This has gone back many, many years ago. The practice began when something was accidentally spilled on the freshly decorated wall. It left an unsightly stain. And on one occasion, an artist, a distinguished artist, came along to spend a few days in that residence. And one day when the family went out for a walk, he stayed behind. And with a few masterful strokes of a piece of charcoal, that ugly spot became the outline of a beautiful waterfall bordered by trees and wildlife. He turned that, dis that uh, disfigured wall into one of his most successful depictions of highland life. That's exactly what God did spiritually with Abraham. The man whose life had been stained by failure, his life had been stained by sin, the Lord in his grace came to him because God had a plan for his life. God had something for him to do. And God therefore restored to him the joy of his great salvation. Uh, so he's back to the altar. He had previously built at Bethel and Hai, verse 4. There he called upon the name of the Lord. Now God, as I mentioned, never spoke to Abraham in Egypt. Of course, I mentioned before, at the very start, God never spoke to Abraham in Haran. But now the line of communication is open again. And the Lord said unto Abram. Now this is really the third time that we know that God spoke to him. In chapter 12 in the opening couple of verses it says the Lord had spoken unto Abram. And then again in verse 7 of chapter 12 and now for the third time in chapter 13 and verse 14. Now when you think about this carefully and I'm not going to do all the work for you. I want to uh, encourage you 
to, to study this book. I want you to look at these things for yourself. On each occasion, God's promise was renewed, but it was also extended. So the Lord is revealing more and more of his will unto his servant. The Lord didn't reveal everything unto Abraham at the start. Abraham had to walk by faith. He had to take a step at a time, and that's the way God always works with his people. So the promise, or the promises were renewed and then extended. The Lord reminded him of some things, and at the same time, the Lord also revealed some things unto him. And that's what happens, child of God, in our own experience. When we read the word of God, the Lord reminds us of something old, what we've known for a lifetime. But we go back to Sunday school days, and at the same time, we always reveal something new. And that's the exciting thing about the book. We never get to know enough about one portion or one verse or one character in the Bible. There's always something more to learn at another time. And that's the amazing thing about the Bible. It's a living book. It's distinguished from every other book. You sit down and, and read Shakespeare or, or some other renowned uh, novelist or po a, po a poet or whatever. And you're reading the same thing. But when you come to the book of God, you're always discovering something fresh, something new, something the Lord wants to, to apply to our hearts, to, to cause our mind to, to, to really develop and to get to know him more and more with the passing of time. Now, the word then in verse 18 is important. When I say that, I say that for this reason. It was when he sought the Lord, verse 4 of chapter 13, and then when he separated from Lot in verse 14. So when he sought the Lord in verse 4, and then when he separated from Lot in verse 14, it was then the Lord began to reveal himself unto him. Initially, God called Abraham alone. You've got to go to Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 2 to discover that the Lord called him alone. But we know a couple of his relatives tagged along. They tagged along. They weren't called. And they proved to be a hindrance. Terah, his father, and Lot, his nephew. And both proved to be a hindrance to Abraham. Terah caused delay. They delay at Haran. That could have been a number of years they, they tarried there. And then when you think about Lot, well, in the context of chapter 13, he caused a vision. You see that? It's a bad thing when brethren caused a vision. Terah died. We know that. But Lot's still in the scene. He's still in the picture. Now, there are three things mentioned in this 13th chapter. If you look there, they all begin with the letter S. This is the way I like to see things. Alliteration is good for me. It helps me to get through the message. If you look there at verse 6 and identify the word substance. Okay, there's the substance. You move into verses 7 and 8. There's another word beginning with S. Strife. It's mentioned twice. In 7 and 8. And then there's a word appearing three times. It's the word separation. Or separate. In verses 9, 11, and 14. So there are three things mentioned here in these verses. Substance, strife, and separation. Now let's talk for a moment briefly about the substance. Back in chapter 12, verse 5, when Abram and Lot left Haran, these two individuals took all their substance. But it did not cause strife. In Egypt, however, Abraham and Lot acquired great wealth. So that after uh, Abraham's restoration, we read in verse 2 of chapter 13, and Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. In verse 6 it says their substance was great. But then move on to the next word, the word strife. There was strife between the herd men of Abram's cattle and the herd men of Lot's cattle, verse 7. Their substance, the substance acquired through turning aside from the path of faith, caused strife. 
So Abraham thought he was prospering, and he was materially, but he wasn't prospering spiritually. And it came back to bite him. It came back to cause the vision between him and Lot. You can see that. Now Abraham separated from Lot. And three times over, as I've indicated, the word separation is found here. Seeking the Lord and separating from Lot can be summed up in the words, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, laying aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So here we can see Abraham looking unto Jesus by faith. And as he does that, then he has to separate from Lot, who was proving to be a hindrance to him. Now we know that Lot was a believer. We know that from Peter. I've mentioned this many times. And so the time came when this man, who was a believer, was weighing Abraham down, was hindering him in his walk with God. And Abraham had to say, I must separate from you. I must go through with God. I must take this pathway. I want God's very best for my life. And I've got to separate from you. Lot made wrong choices in his life because he was not regulated by the word of God. Abraham made right choices because he, he was regulated by the word of God. Now three times over we read in chapter 12 verse 4, 13 verse 1 and verse 5 that Lot went with him. That is he went with Abraham. A saint never fails without affecting others. Lot followed Abram down into Egypt. And it ruined Lot's life. He never was a spiritual man. But it ruined his life. He got a taste of the wealth of the things of the world. And the ways of the world. And he never was the same thereafter. He never was that bright anyway spiritually. That has to be said. But here we have... This, this onus upon the people of God. Lead men to Christ. Don't lead them down into the world. And Abraham, good man as he was, he led Lot down into Egypt and it ruined his life. Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, verse 12b. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. And then the Bible says in verse 11, Lot journeyed east. That's significant. He's journeying east. He turned his back on Bethel, the house of God. And he moved towards Ai, the heap of ruins. And then we're told he pitched his tent in verse 12. But Abram removed his tent and built an altar in Hebron. He's moving in the right direction. Lot is moving in the wrong direction. And uh, when you think of a story, think of where he ended up. It's frightening. The Lord said unto Abram, verse 14, but in verses 10 through 13, God doesn't speak to Lot. He's on his own. He's doing his own thing. He's going his own way. He's not going to follow Abraham any longer. He's going his own way. The altar was a place of, of fellowship then. God directed Abraham to Mamre, which is in Hebron. And both these names are deeply significant. Hebron denotes a range of, of uh, meaning. It can mean colleague. It can mean alliance and friend. And the most common meaning of the word is fellowship. It's derived from a word for friend. I mentioned here on Sunday that on three different occasions, Abraham is described in the Bible as the friend of God in Chronicles, in Isaiah, and in the book of James. No one else had that distinction. No one else was ever called a friend of God, just this man, the man who failed, the man who went down to Egypt, the man who was restored, the man who was lifted up again, the man who got back to the altar, and the man who called upon the name of the Lord at that altar. Now Jesus called Lazarus his friend. And of course when you read John. I think it is 15. All those who believe are his friends. Vance Havner 
was an American evangelist. And he said, if we are beset by unseen foes, we are also befriended by an unseen friend. Great is our adversary, but thank God, great is our ally. Now Hebron was about 22 miles south of uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem means the city of peace. Where there is peace with God, fellowship is not far away. Isn't that right? When there's peace with God, fellowship is not far away. Now you think about the order in these chapters. Bethel is mentioned in verse 3, and then Hebron in verse 18. Now spiritually speaking, it's impossible to live in Hebron without first passing through Bethel. Entering into fellowship, the fellowship of Hebron, after he separated from Lot. That was a blessed time for Abraham. He's moving on in the right direction. Now the Greek word for fellowship comes from a root meaning, common or shared. And Christian fellowship is two-dimensional, vertical before it can be horizontal. We must know the reality of fellowship with the Father and the Son before we can know the reality of fellowship with each other. And if we're not in fellowship with God, it's impossible for us to be in fellowship with our fellow believer. But if we are right with God and in fellowship with him, then following on from that fellowship with God, living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, then we will be in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That is an important point to consider. If we're right with God, then we'll be right with our fellow believer. And if we're not right with our fellow believer, we're not right with God. It's as simple as that. That's it. Caleb was a man who wholeheartedly followed the Lord. What was his, what was his inheritance? He brought fellowship with God. The man who wholly follows the Lord will enjoy fellowship with God. And by the way, I haven't time to develop it now, but in chapter 18, Abraham sat in the door of his tent in Yes, you've guessed where it was, Hebron. Who came to meet with him? Well, there were three individuals. Two angels, we know that. But the other one he called, my Lord. It's a Christophany. It's the appearing of Jesus Christ. That's the point I'm emphasizing, you see. He's in the place of fellowship. He's in that place where Christ came and met with him. And he met with the Savior. Oh, to be in that place tonight. Fellowship with God. And then finally... The altar was a place of fruitfulness. The word mamre means fatness. It can also mean riches. It can also mean fruitfulness. And Hebron means fellowship. So we have something interesting here. Together they give a picture of the fruitfulness of a restored fellowship. And Abraham was restored to God. He was now right with God. He was regulated by God. And three places uh, we read that he lifted up his eyes. Chapter 13 and verse 14. And he beheld the land, the appointed place. The Lord told him to look to the north, the south, and the east, and the west. And this, I'll give you all of this. That was the land. Lift up your eyes. I'm going to give you this. That's the appointed place. Chapter 18, verse 2. He beheld three men. And the Lord was one of those individuals. That was the amazing person. And then in chapter 22, verse 13, he lifted up his eyes again and he saw a ram caught in the thicket and numbered provision. Oh, keep lifting up your eyes to heaven. Keep looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith because he's far above all our problems, far above all of our difficulties, all the perplexing things in life. He's in control of every situation. Get your focus on him tonight. We all need to focus on him. Lift up your eyes and see what the Lord has promised to give us, what the Lord has promised to do for his church, for his people. And around tonight uh, at the throne of grace, plead the promises, get before God, pray down the blessing of God. If things are hard, pray that God will make things soft. If people are hard, pray that God will uh, take a dealing with them and cause their hearts to melt under the preaching of the gospel. If people are not coming to church under the means of grace, 
pray that God will bring them in because he's promised to do what we ask in his name according to his will. Is it God's will for people to be under the means of grace? Yes, it is. Well, we need to plead the promise of God. Lift up your eyes tonight. Lot lifted up his eyes as well and all he could see were temporal things. The plain of Jordan. That sufficed him. The carnal man ended up in Sodom in the company of sinners. The spiritual man ended up in Hebron in the place of communion with God. Lot had a tent, but he, have it. he never had an altar. He didn't seek the Lord for wisdom in making his, descent, his decisions. Where did he end up? In a cave. Now you think about it. When we read of him at the start, he's in a tent. Then as we continue to read his story, in the chapter 19, he's in a house. And at the end of the chapter 19, he's in a cave. Spiraling down all the time. And what happens with Abraham? Well, he's lifted up. He gets to Hebron, the place of fellowship with God. The Lord shows him wonderful things. He has the experience. And then ultimately, where does he, where does he go? Where does he end up at? He climbs Mount Moriah. And he sees Jesus there. Because Jesus said that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. What was that day? Well, it was a day when he saw a substitute taking the place of his beloved son on Mount Moriah. He saw Jesus in that. He saw Christ in that. He saw the work of, of the Redeemer there. This is where the spiritual man ended up at. He beheld the Lord in all of his glory. Hebron is a place of fellowship. Mamre is the place of fruitfulness. Judah means praise. The order is true to the Christian experience, separation, fellowship, fruitfulness, and praise. May we see the Lord tonight. May he lead us up that mount, and may we see Jesus crucified, and keep our eyes on him during the time of prayer. Focus on him as we come to pray tonight. So here's a man who moved in the right direction, now, by way of conclusion, could I ask you, in the fear of God, are you moving in the right direction? Are we moving in the right direction? Are we moving on into that place of blessed communion and fellowship with God? That's the place to be. That's the place that will make the difference. That place of communion with God. Now, I'd invite you to pray with us tonight, as many as possible. Join in. And uh, if you feel you need to pray a couple of times, feel free to do so. I'd encourage as many as possible. Maybe someone who's never prayed before, I'd encourage you to pray tonight and enter in. Encourage us by your prayers. And you can be assured, I'll be praying for you as you do. Let's pray.